Welcome to Mayo Clinic Q&A. I'm Dr. Sanj Kakar. As we start a new year, we look back on lessons learned during the COVID-19 pandemic. 2020 was certainly a challenging year with constant change as we gain new knowledge and understanding of COVID-19. How has Mayo Clinic adjusted and continues to care safely for its patients? And what is ahead in 2021? Joining us to discuss this is the Chair of Mayo Clinic Outpatient Practice, Dr. Connell Loftus. Welcome back to the program, Dr. Loftus, and Happy New Year. Good morning, uh, Sanj. Good morning, Jen. And uh, thanks so much for the invitation again. And Happy New Year to you and Happy New Year to uh, all of your listeners and viewers. Really appreciate the invitation. So, Dr. Loftus, uh, as we start the new year, when you look back at 2020, what were the major lessons that you learned regarding the care of our patients here at Mayo Clinic? Wow, when you roll back to this time last year and you think about how we were living back then and where we are a year later, so much has happened, uh, but we have learned so much. Um, and, and there's so much we could talk about in this space, but there are a number of words that come to mind when I think about what we have learned. I think about vision. I think about teamwork. I think about data guiding our response. I think about our people. Um, and that's intertwined with teamwork. But probably the greatest, um, the greatest thing we observed in the, in the entirety of the response is how, how our people came together in adversity, responded uh, and synergized to create a situation where we were not, all, not, 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 not only able to survive, but thrive within this environment. And that may seem like a, like a big statement, but I believe it's true. And I will say that, you know, I know what we did within the Mayo Clinic environment, but and, and I expect that is what people have done regionally, nationally, internationally, across the world, that these, these circumstances were really, really exceptional. And in exceptional circumstances, that really pulls people together. And uh, I know that has happened elsewhere, but I would emphasize at Mayo Clinic, it was, has been absolutely unbelievable to see the synergy and the teamwork. And I could list so many teams that have come together to, to deactivate the practice in the outpatient, reactivate the practice, whether it be outpatient, hospital, surgical, procedural, whatever, where the teams, the energy, the synergy, the innovation, the creativity, you just don't want to leave the team. You don't want to not be there. You wake up every morning, you come and you say, we have got such an unbelievable team working on this. We have, got, we have cracked this nut. And we did crack the nut in teamwork. But not only that, as I say, dealing with adversity and the teamwork and people coming together. Teamwork, number one. Number two, vision, visionary people, okay? Visionary people being able to see, we've got to shut down the practice. But just like we shut down the practice, we've got to reactivate the practice. Our patients need us. They're calling us. And then when the second surge came, we can deactivate the practice to a degree, but we can keep the majority of the practice going now safely. The vision to be able to work through all of that has been really guided by what we learned, as we'll speak about, but also data. And as I say, teamwork, vision, and data were key elements. And the data guiding us, and not only you know, leadership seeing the data, but sharing it with, 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 our, with our colleagues and our people and our employees, such that they trust the system and they trust our, our, our leadership that are guiding us to work through these exceptional circumstances. So there's many, many facets, but I would say that those are three key elements that are teams of people responding together in adversity, um, our, our, our leadership and the vision that they've been able to portray uh, and using using data to guide us through the circumstances have, have put us in a position of strength and not only to survive, as I say, to thrive through these exceptional circumstances. Yeah, as you said, the culture here at Mayo Clinic runs deep, uh, especially with patient safety and care and innovation. And hundreds, if not thousands of people have been involved. Can you share with us, as you said, there's so many examples. Can you share with us one example where you thought, wow, I really wasn't expecting that. People really came to the fore uh, above and beyond what even you thought could be done. Can I give you two? Sure. <laughs> and I could, I could give you 20, I could give you 40, but I will give you two. The COVID frontline care team, the CFCT is a group of doctors and many of them are in, in general internal medicine, 
their normal day job is seeing outpatient, uh, you know, general internal medicine patients. They stepped forward back in March. What, what the CFCT or COVID frontline care team stands for is virtually caring for patients who have been identified as having COVID. So their test has come back positive. They're in the community. We're trying to prevent them going into the hospital and we're caring from the, for them virtually at home. This became their job and they work this round the clock. So in tw eight or 12 hour shifts. Um, and it was a new job. A new, a completely new uh, body of work for them, but they have done an exceptional job. And it's providers, it's nursing staff, it's 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 desk operations staff, it's so many team members again coming together. An unbelievable synergy of of energies to to create an exceptional team. That's one team. The second team um, is is the team that helped us deploy the monoclonal antibody therapies so as you will recall and I, i'll give an example when president trump got ill he, he one of the things that happened was he got a cocktail a cocktail of monoclonal antibodies that that, that helped him stay well those antibodies became available to the general public and to people at, at large about two or three months ago one of them is a medication called Bamlan, bamlanivimab and there's another medication also so we put together an infusion therapy team um, out at our 41st Street site who have who have brought these antibody therapies to outpatients. So outpatient tests positive for COVID, they satisfy certain criteria. And instead of those patients going to the hospital, they went to an outpatient setting, got an infusion of the medication and the hospitalization for that group of patients, the hospitalization rate dropped from 10% to 3%. So substantial differences there. And we've infused about 2,000 of these infusions across the enterprise, 1,500 across the Midwest practice, 1,000 in Rochester, sorry, 500 in Rochester and 1,000 across the, the, the Mayo Clinic Health System practice. I would include there 60 patients infused at nursing home sites in the nursing home. So this became not only a, 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 an infusion therapy center treatment, but they developed a mobile unit, unbelievable. And they basically packed up a van with these medications, drove out to the nursing homes and infused patients at the nursing homes to control nursing home potential outbreaks. Absolutely unbelievable, exceptional work that, was, uh, that has been amazing. And, and so it, there, there are two fantastic examples. I could go on and on, but I will stop there. Thank you. No, no, no. Thank you, Dr. Loftus, for sharing those wonderful examples and tribute to people that are doing tremendous work all the time above and beyond their uh, call of duty, as it were. So as you said, when you look back at where we were this time last year to where we are now, how have you seen the outpatient practice when patients come to Mayo Clinic now? How are they being safely managed to get expert care? Uh, great question, uh, Sanj, and thank you for, for asking. You know, when we were initially faced with the pandemic back in March, we were faced, uh, fear was uh, to the fore in all of our minds, our patients' minds, our providers' minds. We did not know what, uh, how to manage the situation, hence the shutdown in the outpatient practice and the practice at large. Multiple measures were put in place, uh, whether it be screening patients uh, up front before they came to Mayo Clinic, screening patients at the door, masking, universal masking within our uh, within our within our clinics and within our um, buildings, um, social distancing, uh, all of these were, were were highly impactful. Probably the most impactful, of course, of all was was masking. And we had we did a uh, our colleagues in engineering uh, did a fantastic study looking at masking and the effects the effect the, the effectiveness of masking you know, at various distances and various angles in front of the patient that's actually being submitted to the Mayo Clinic proceedings and is going to be published. So again, phenomenal work from within and from the teams to make our environment safe, but screening ahead of time, screening at the door, testing select group of patients before they came to Mayo Clinic, um, masking and social distancing uh, were the key elements. We had a, 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 a fantastic group of, of of people who came together under the leadership of Claudia Lucanetti from Neurology, the smart group, who put together a whole infrastructure of, 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 of team members to respond to the practice. Many people were out there in the practice and they were fearful. We needed a means to connect between leadership and the practice to hear 
hear the hear the fear and to understand the fear and then to work through the fear together. And those that smart team, those smart champions really helped us navigate through such that when it came to the second wave that we just worked through in the fall, when we shut down the outpatient practice going from 100% volumes down to five or 10% volumes in the springtime, we were able to navigate through the second surge and just decrease our outpatient volumes from 100% to 85%. So what we learned and how to practice safely, we was able to guide us in this in the second surge here in the fall and to guide us successfully. So we were able to continue to bring care to the patients who need who need us on an ongoing basis. So as you mentioned, we're certainly not out of this yet, and we see all around the country um, areas where there's surges. So as we go through, we've just come through Christmas and New Year's and people are coming back home. How do you anticipate that affecting the outpatient practice moving forward? Specifically, the uh, the recent uh, holiday seasons, Christmas and New Year. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a good question. And it's um, we we will see how this played out, plays out. Uh, Thankfully, Thanksgiving did not create a very significant bump. There was certainly a small increase. And we can see even within recent days, recent weeks, maybe a slight upward tick and we're monitoring that closely. we, we hope uh, that people were wise during the holiday period. We believe that many were, but so, you know, that wisdom will hopefully guide, um, guide people to continue to be safe in their practices going forward. And we will talk about that and the implications of vaccination to that in a moment. But I suspect that there will be a small uh, increase in activity, a small increase in t- pos- positive tests, but uh, hopefully it won't be a significant surge like we saw in the fall or before. So let's talk about telemedicine. Uh, as you said, in, in, in March and April, when the practice sort of um, shut down for in-person visits, telemedicine took, took off so we could really stay connected with our patients. How has that now entered the part of the outpatient practice um, now and, and you see moving forward? So Sanj, telemedicine is definitely here to stay and it's here to stay to help you and I see patients and bring excellent care to our patients wherever they are. We had uh, a lot of work going on in the telemedicine space before the pandemic. Our colleagues in Connected Care, a fantastic group, uh, were working on this and we were making steady progress, but the pandemic really accelerated that uh, progress and it was one of the silver linings here. I was at a retreat back on March 5 and 6, and one of our goals down in Arizona, we want to hardwire in telemedicine into our outpatient practice and really accelerate. Boy, we just had to take the back seat, and we were (laughs) accelerated in the fast lane, like down the M1 in in, in England. Um, And really, telemedicine, so we've gone from, if I take the the outpatient practice we were we had maybe five percent or ten percent at most of our visits really about five percent of our visits were virtual pre-pandemic okay um as we sit here today we're more like 15 20 percent okay now arizona surging currently they're at 30 percent currently because of the surge um, our goal is by the end of 2021 to hardwire in telemedicine such that about 20 to 25% of our outpatient visits are virtual visits. And, and that is tremendous value for the patient. When, when you see um, a patient, no matter where they are in the world, can connect with us uh, easily. And we're working through that to, to make sure that it's an easy connection. They can connect with a, pri- a provider or a care team member. We can learn their story. We can learn what their problem is, learn whether it's in your area, an orthopedic issue or a wrist problem or in my area, a gastrointestinal problem. I can learn what the patient's needs are before they come to the to Mayo Clinic. Do they need to come to Mayo Clinic? Can we provide the care without them coming? Or do they need to come to Mayo Clinic? And if they need to come to Mayo Clinic, then we can... Um, we can ensure that we have all the right specialists lined up to see them when they arrive on site. So that's for new patients coming in. For established patients who have been here before, if they've come twice a year, maybe they need to continue to come physically twice a year, or maybe one visit would be virtual and one visit is, 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 is on site. But you can see the tremendous value that will, will ensue when we're even more prepared for the patient. And, and you and I as providers, we don't have to call around to our friends, well, the patient came and they wanted to see a migraine specialist in addition to their abdominal pain. I'm not playing catch up as a provider. 
and, and, and this will lead to increased value to the patient, increased facility for the care we provide as patients, and at the end of the day, um, more satisfied patients, more satisfied providers. I also foresee a world whereby if 25% of our practice is virtual, this will will enhance the flexibility that we have in terms of provider calendars. Um, you know, providers may want to work in the morning or in the evening and look after their kids during the day, or there are all sorts of permutations that will ensue from this, perhaps even weekends uh, uh, and so on and so forth. So I would say value to patient, ease of seeing the patient for the provider and flexibility for provider and care team members will be something, will be key factors that will, will emanate from the, the hard wiring of telemedicine in our practice. So as you mentioned, um, how the practice will evolve, you talk about telemedicine from what we've been through in the last coming up to a, just shy of a year now, what else do you see maybe some permanent changes, permanent's a hard word, but you know, changes that you think will be implemented in the outpatient practice that we didn't have say a year ago? Yeah, good question. Um, so I would say the big one, the one we will walk away from 2020 with, and we will say that was the, the, the key, that was a, uh, the turning point is telemedicine. So that's number one. Um, number two is, I, I suspect, and I think it's not only unique to the outpatient practice, we will have a lot more um, teleworking and uh, virtual connectivity. And we, we that's a, an interesting space. Um, uh, but I think it's here to say, I think the facility of pulling people together virtually on Zoom meetings, we've all seen the value of that. But I, I think that in addition to that, we need to realize the value of our, the culture that we've created through people connecting with people face-to-face um, -face also. So it'll be a fine balance there, whereby we need to bring our people together to have that, so the unique, um, the chemistry that we develop together as people uh, shouldn't be completely supplanted by virtual connections. So I would say telemedicine will be here to stay. I think we will have more virtual connections and teleworking, but I think we need to be careful with regard to how we control that so we don't compromise our, our unique chemistry. And I, I will put a, I would put a teaser out there on a third one. I was walking in this morning with colleagues and I was, I was you know, they said, boy, this masking, I wonder if we're, you know, there would be periods of the time where we will be masking in the future. And here, here's the fact, we have seen zero flu all this season, zero flu. Um, and it's because of masking and it's because of social distancing and it's because of all of the hand washing. And when we go back to March and we saw the tail end of last year's flu season, flu disappeared when we started masking. So will we see more broadly a uh, different approach to how we deal with um, flu season and such like in the future? Maybe. So I'll just put that out there out as a teaser as well with regard to how the world may be seen differently going forward. Yeah, and that's a good point. I uh, It was on the news the other day also about flu across the country. Yeah. Uh, I think dropped by 98%, uh, which is remarkable considering the worry that we had going into the winter season. So when one other thing- of, When you think about that, absolutely. It's it's not only regional, it's a nationwide phenomenon. And if you if you extrapolate the potential impact there with regard to absenteeism and, and all the rest of it, um, it it's, it's very significant. So the vaccine is obviously a hot topic. It's very poignant right now. How do you see the vaccination uh, affecting how we take care of patients moving forward uh, in 2021? So I, I would say the first thing I would, I, I would say, you know, we're extremely grateful and thankful to the scientific community who have developed the vaccine in such a, in such a rapid course of time and to develop such an effective vaccine. Um, uh, I'm going for my vaccine here at 9.30 this morning. I know Dr. Kikara has been vaccinated. I hope everybody can get to vaccination and I hope that our uptake rates with vaccination will be high. It's very important that we leverage the power of vaccine this is a key component for us to being able to return to normal life. If we want to return to normal life, we need to get people vaccinated. That's my first message. Um, number two, how will it affect the outpatient practice? Um, I, I, as people get vaccinated, we're already getting questions with regard to, well, can we do this? Can we do that? Can we you know, start having our meetings face to face and so on and so forth again? And the, the bottom line in this space is it's going to take uh, months 
for us to get through this phase of getting people vaccinated and to be able to carefully and eventually get back to, toward normal life. Now, as I, as I say months, I don't think that's going to happen for at least three to six months. So I think that when we, we, we will get vaccinated and we will, everybody, you know, or those who wish to get vaccinated will get vaccinated, but we're not going to see a rapid transition in February or March. I think it'll be during the summer months, we will eventually, I think, be able to, to start moving back toward more normal life, but it'll be a, in a stepwise manner and it'll be guided by our, our fantastic infectious disease specialists. So I don't see significant change in the near term, probably by the second and third quarters of the year, we will see our, our outpatient practice and the remainder of our practice returning more toward normal. But again, what will be the elements that will be hardwired in? Telemedicine is here to stay. Will we have masking at certain times of the year? We'll see. And I think that we need to remain vigilant. You know, the 2020 and 2021 have been years of unremarkable, uh, have been years of remarkable learning that, that, the, that the pandemics can occur like that and develop. Uh, and so we need to be, what we've learned from this pandemic we will undoubtedly apply to future similar events, unfortunately, but we will be much better equipped to deal with them, thankfully, from what we've learned through this. Yeah, I think your key word of vigilance is right on. I mean, if we look back at our home nation, we can see what's happening there uh, with the national lockdown. So I think that is absolutely poignant in, in what you mentioned. So Connor, anything else that you'd like to talk before I ask uh, about your uh, prediction? No, again, as I say, I, I would emphasize that this has been a time of tremendous challenge and adversity. I would emphasize, and I think that this is, you know, within Mayo Clinic, we've seen a tremendous response from the people in terms of teamwork and synergy and innovation. I know that that has been not only a Mayo Clinic response, it's been a national, international response to deal with this pandemic. But I, I would, you know, I, I would emphasize that the special culture that we have at Mayo people working together really, really helped us not only survive, but thrive. And I say, as I say, we're, we're hopefully two thirds of the way through this, uh, maybe not quite two thirds, but hopefully close to that. And the, the, the accelerator now becomes our vaccine and being vigilant uh, and deployment of the vaccine is moving forward. I would encourage people to get vaccinated um, and, and allow us to return to a normal life. In terms of predictions for 2021, as I say, we'll get the vaccine rolled out. Um, and, and the rollout of the vaccine, I would remind people, is really, really contingent upon demand. Uh, or, uh, sorry, or contingent upon supply. The supply has been limited up front. And so when, when we feel it's moving slower than it should be, that's really, really, really based upon the supply. And the companies have done a fantastic job to develop the vaccine. And we're, and that's the supply is increasing. And as the supply increases, we'll be able to get all, all of the listeners and viewers hopefully vaccinated that haven't been vaccinated so far. But as we get vaccinated, please be vigilant. Please continue to mask. Please continue to 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 listen to to those uh, you know the leaders that we've listened to and be, and we've been guided to. We need to continue to mask. We need to continue to social distance for months into the future to ensure that we uh, we, we 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 reach a safe state in a in an appropriate and timely manner. And finally, Dr. Kikar, I can't let you go, but by mentioning uh, one other prediction I have for 2021, and I will I will say to our listeners and viewers. Dr. Kakar is from London, but despite from being from London, he's a very, very fervent Liverpool soccer team supporter. And despite my being from Ireland, I'm a very, very fervent Manchester United supporter. And I've been so for, since 1985, pre-Alex Ferguson, by the way. And so myself and Sanj Kakar are very, we're, we're, we're competing here in a daily, weekly manner. And my prediction is, for the 2021 season that Manchester United are going to push Liverpool all the way and pip you to the Premier League title this year. So I put that out there and we will see how that transpires, uh, Dr. Kakar. Well, Dr. Loftus, I appreciate you sharing this and with our, our listeners and viewers all around the world that they've heard how misguided you are regarding your uh, soccer affiliation. But I look forward to our healthy rivalry moving forward. 
Oh, um, thanks. I, I always appreciate the opportunity here. Uh, a little fun and joy is important. We need to imbue our lives with fun and, and laughter and smile as we work through adversity. It's important. And again, Dr. Kikar and Jen, uh, uh, Ms. O'Hara, I really, really appreciate the opportunity here this morning to, to share what we've been working through, to share uh, what everybody has done and to thank uh, everybody, not only at Mayo, across the region, across Minnesota, across the country, across the world, for their hard work in responding to the pandemic and helping us all work through this, this difficult time. So thank you all. Well said, Dr. Loftus. It's always an honor and a privilege to have you on the show. Uh, our thanks again to the chair of the outpatient practice at Mayo Clinic, Dr. Connor Loftus. Mayo Clinic Q&A is a production of the Mayo Clinic News Network and is available wherever you get and subscribe to your favorite podcasts. To see a list of all Mayo Clinic podcasts, visit newsnetwork.mayoclinic.org. Then click on podcasts. Thanks for listening and be well. <laughs>